We did make a film, um, an animation, a four-minute animation for this event, um, made by the lexicon of sustainability, Douglas Gayton and Laura, um, and, uh, who are both here. And it's called A Tale of Two Chickens. And uh, those of you who are at the London conference, uh, I did mention a conversation I had with my mum about this a few years ago, where she asked me what the true cost of a cheap chicken was. So this is, um, my mum's still with us, just. Um, but uh, this is inspired by her and uh, hopefully creates, uh, emphasizes the questions which were uh, brilliantly um, framed for us by the three keynotes before the coffee. So uh, after this is over, um, Daniel Nuremberg will ta take over from Food Tank to moderate the next session. Here we go. This is a tale of two chickens. One raised on pasture and the other raised on a factory farm. How is it possible that a chicken is now cheaper, pound for pound, than bread? A factory farmed chicken is raised in a warehouse in intensely crowded conditions. And its feed comes from crops that depend on industrial farming practices whose pesticides and fertilizers degrade our biodiversity, soil, and water. The pasture-raised chicken leads a healthy life with much of it spent outside. Its feed is grown without the use of synthetic pesticides. Waste from a factory farm poultry operation can pollute waterways and emit large amounts of gases like ammonia, which pollutes the air we breathe, and nitrous oxide, which thins the ozone layer and contributes to climate change. While forcing people to work for low pay in often hazardous conditions. The intense crowding of poultry in these environments also increases the likelihood of sickness and infection and often requires the use of preventive antibiotics. When humans eat these chickens, they can develop infections resistant to these very same antibiotics, which can lead to serious health problems. And it's your taxes which help support many of these farming practices through agricultural subsidies. When you add up all these hidden costs, cheaper chicken isn't so cheap after all. Who's to blame? Food producers are stuck in an economic system that mainly rewards those who provide us food at the cheapest price. It's a story that repeats. With carrots, apples, and peas, meat, milk, and cheese, even with breakfast cereal. This rigged, cheap food system has two prices, the one you pay now and the one we all pay later. At some point, we need to ask ourselves, why do we support such a destructive system? There are six things we can do to change our food system. What if we decided to reward producers for food that benefits the environment and improves public health? What if we linked farm bill subsidies, crop insurance, and food stamps to encourage more sustainable farming and food products? What if chemical fertilizers and pesticides were taxed thereby encouraging farmers to reduce their use and adopt more carbon-friendly soil practices? And what if health insurance providers incentivized people with healthier diets? What if investors supported community-based, sustainable businesses? And what if the marketplace paid workers a living wage and gave them safer working conditions? By making the right choices, we help create the food system we all want to see for ourselves, our families, and our community. And you can start by telling people the tale of two chickens. It's just one of many stories 
that will change the way we look at food. Now everyone can see me, I think. Um, that was a great film. Let's give it another round of applause. I think it was such a good depiction of what's going on. Um, i put this down. My name is Danielle Nirenberg, and I am the president of an organization called Food Tank. It's such an incredible honor to be here. I want to thank Patrick Holden and the Sustainable Food Trust, all of his colleagues and his sponsors for putting this uh, amazing event together. Uh, I also want to thank the Lexicon of Sustainability for that great film. Um, and, and looking out at this room, I, I can't believe how impressive it is. And it's impressive to me not only because it's full of some of the foremost experts on food and agriculture, really, from all over the world, but it really represents a paradigm shift around what it will take to overcome some of the world's most pressing environmental and social problems. The people in this room understand that food production doesn't have to come at the expense of natural resources, human rights, or animal welfare. And people who share the conviction that they're environmentally, environmentally economically, and socially sustainable ways that we can put in place today to make hunger, obesity, poverty, food loss, and food waste part of the world's past, not its future. And, you know, I, I think we've already heard a lot about the bad news, thanks to Jonathan Foley and this film. I, you know, we, we know how we've messed up the planet. So I feel like with this panel, we have a real opportunity to talk about the good news and, and the solutions. Um, the people on this panel realize that business as usual is no longer an option. And, uh, you know, if we want to achieve financial and environmental sustainability in the, food, in the food sector, we really need to change the way we're doing things. And all of us as eaters, as farmers, as funders and donors, as uh, businesses, as storytellers and advocates, we, have, we all have this role to play in envisioning what true cost accounting in the food system can look like. And on a personal note, I'm really, really hopeful because so many great organizations and individuals are, are leading, the, you know, being forceful on this issue and getting more attention and research and investment towards it. So I, I won't spend a lot of time introducing our panelists, their program, their bios are in the programs, and you can read more about them. Um, but I, I'll, I'll start off by introducing someone who kind of needs no introduction. Uh, Kathleen Merrigan, as you all know, was the former U.S. Deputy uh, Agriculture Secretary from 2009 to 2013. Uh, at USDA, she created the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative, and it was a key architect in the Let's Move campaign, among her many other accomplishments at USDA. She was also a professor at the Tufts University Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, and today is the director or the executive director of sustainability at the George Washington University. Alexander Mueller uh, has had a very interesting career. He's the former minister of agriculture uh, in Germany during the 1990s and really built their renewable energy program. He also worked at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and currently is uh, leading TEAB Ag Food. Uh, TEAB stands for the Economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. And Teab Ag Food is really leading the efforts to put together a comprehensive economic evaluation of the food system. And last but not least is Steve Hilton, the CEO of CrowdPack. And I'm really excited about CrowdPack because it's giving voters back the power, giving them more information uh, about the candidates that they're voting for through a scorecard. Uh, Steve was previously the senior advisor to the, uh, David Cameron in the United Kingdom, and he is most recently the author of a new book called More Human, which has a, a chapter on true cost accounting. 
and uh, is available for sale and signing here. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us. This is a real opportunity to hear from experts in this field about, you know, again, the good news, what's happening on the ground, what are the solutions, policies, and practices that are out there. Uh, my plan, I'm going to take a seat, uh, is to just kick off uh, each of the panelists with a question. They ha will have five to ten minutes to answer. And then I want to leave a lot of room for Q&A from all of you so that we're not only hearing uh, from the experts on the stage, but also the experts in the audience. So Alexander, I, I think what uh, is, would be really helpful, at least for me, is uh, to, to ask you a really basic but important question, and that's, why is the issue of true cost accounting in the food system so important? Why do we need to make the, the business case that Patrick uh, talked about earlier? Thanks a lot. First of all, I would like to congratulate Patrick, his team, and all the people, the companies, the foundations who have supported this conference. I think the first hour made it very clear that the system has to change. Now we have the task to explain in five minutes how to change it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not so quite sure if we are really going to do it and therefore I only want to present three simple messages to you and of course I want to promote our study interim report work in progress and the three messages are the first message is what we are not going to do with this study. It's important to show the boundaries and to avoid misunderstandings. The second issue is I would like to talk about the paradigm shift we need and the change of the predominant narrative on the food system, far-reaching. And third, I would like to present an example of ongoing work where we try to connect the dots. So three messages. First, we don't want to commodify nature. A lot of people say, these guys from TEEP, they want to develop a new neoliberal concept to monetize nature and social relations. Sorry, we are not going to do it. We want to do the opposite. We want to go beyond GDP. GDP is the most powerful figure in the world. Whenever you do damage to the environment, whenever you have a health problem, this increases GDP. Something must be wrong. Therefore. We would like to find a way to do accounting of the natural and social capital we are using to produce our food. So far, water, fertile soil, biodiversity was for free. You could consume it. You don't get a price at the markets. You only get a contribution to GDP if you clean up the mess afterwards. If you have a landfill, a lot of dirt, a lot of toxic substances in it, if you clean it up, it increases the GDP. This is wrong. What we want to do is that we have a clear budgeting of the social and natural capital we need to produce our food. And if we have this holistic view, you will immediately see that this is changing the narrative of our food production. The dominant message in the food system is we have to produce more. The world population is growing, we have to produce more, at least 60% more, otherwise we cannot feed the world. What we would like to present is that there are different ways to feed a growing population. Sometimes cheap food is very, very expensive. And we would like to make the proof that cheap food has very high costs. Maybe not now, not immediately, maybe also costs in other sectors. And this is what true cost accounting wants to do. We would like to have a complete valuation of the interaction of the food system with environment and with social systems. This does not mean that we want to have a dollar price on everything. There are many issues you cannot put a price tag on it. Cultural relations, for example. Food is very often culture. Food is livelihood, but we have to recognize it, and the current system is not recognizing it, and the farmers don't get paid for it. And therefore, developing a new and comprehensive framework which allows us to identify what are the inputs for food, it's not only fertilizers. 
it's also biodiversity, it's fertile soil, it's clean water. What are the visible and invisible costs? That's the first task we want to do. We want to get a comprehensive overview. And we want to connect the dots. Connecting the dots means looking at what are the high costs of cheap food in the health system. And we heard a lot of really threatening presentations in the first hour today. And therefore, we would like to present a new scheme, a comprehensive valuation, where policymakers, consumers, could make an informed choice. And let me tell you, that's a long and winding road. This is not going to happen overnight, because there is an imbalance of power. If you look at the powerful agricultural system all over the world, you will see it's not easy and it's not always a win-win situation. But why are we doing it? And here I would like to present some examples, and I have still 51 seconds. One example of what does it mean to increase production of maize, of corn. We have commissioned a study financed by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, thanks a lot for it, where we are looking at the global production systems of maize. And if you look at these systems, you will immediately find out that there is not one system. There are at least three different types of systems. A highly biodiverse system for immediate consumption of maize. Mexico as an example, beyond the wall, beyond the future wall. There is a second system, <coughs> organic production of maize, small scale and large scale. And there's an industrial production system which takes place mainly here in the United States. And when the agricultural community, the very traditional one, is talking about let's close the yield gaps, let's produce more, they are talking about the industrial system. Some figures. The United States are producing 60 to 65 percent of all corn in the world. But only one percent of this corn is used for direct consumption. The rest is used for industrial purposes, bioethanol, or animal feed. And therefore, if we talk about increasing production, the question is, what type of corn production do we want to increase, for whom, and what are the costs? And here I would like to present some, some figures. If you look at one part of corn production for high fructose corn syrup, that's around 8% of the corn produced here, you will immediately see that we have a very close link to health-related issues. Obesity, diabetes. Of course, this is not only linked to fructose syrup, it's also sugar and lifestyles and and and. But if a government decides to subsidize production of maize, which is used to produce fructose, you run into a situation where you have to pay twice. First, subsidies for producing corn, and then you have to pay for health-related issues. And there are some very interesting figures. Over the last half century, the average annual consumption per capita of high-calorie sweeteners increased by 18 kilos per person and year. This is the result of subsidies to produce corn in a cheaper way. The producers of this fructose syrup have benefited from implicit subsidies of around 250 million US dollars every year. And if you go back to the year 1986, the subsidies are more than $4 billion to produce more fructose syrup in the end to make soft drinks cheaper. And you all know what are the health impacts of cheap uh, soft drinks. So between 1985 and 2000, the real cost of unsubsidized fresh fruits and vegetables increased by 40% and the cost of fructose syrup decreased. And therefore, the gap is getting bigger, and Patrick is waving, he says, five more minutes. The, 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 gap, is, the, the, the gap is getting bigger between subsidized fructose syrup and fresh fruits and vegetables. If we don't change the policies based on true cost accounting, we will have to pay twice, and this is my last minute, Patrick, because if we look at a new report of the World Health Organization, they 
have found out that on a global basis, the annual cost of diabetes is 827 billion US dollars every year. Diabetes. Diabetes has increased since 1980 by 400%. And there is a close link between agricultural policies, subsidizing fructose syrup, producing more maize, on the other hand, having higher prices for fruits and vegetables, and the cost for diabetes. And what we try to do is we try to capture this in a holistic way. We will identify a lot of research gaps. And that's my last sentence. We also would like to find out if different production systems have different impacts on the environment. I don't want to forget, if you go along the Mississippi and you come to the sea, you find a lot of dead zones because of the overuse of pesticides and nitrogen. And this is the other part of the equation. So you have environmental damage health problems, but you have cheap corn, fructose, syrup. This cannot be the solution for feeding the world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alexander. Um, I'm going to switch gears and, and uh, turn to Kathleen Merrigan. Um, Kathleen, so given that you were at the USDA, you literally had a seat at the table in the Obama administration for several years. Why has the economic climate towards sustainable agriculture been so unfavorable? So that's the first part of the question. And where do you see the hope for the next administration and the next Secretary of Agriculture? Oh, those are easy questions. Thank you. <laughs> so we've already heard about a lot of numbers this morning. Alexander just reinforced several of those. I want to throw out a number today, too. 40,000. 40,000. That's the number of USDA employees that took Organic 101 and 201 web-based courses, an initiative led by Mark Lipson, an organic farmer from Molino Creek Cooperative, just outside of Santa Cruz. and He's here today. Did a great job. He did this when he served as the organic sustainable advisor to the secretary and to myself as deputy. Yep, Mark, Mark left that beautiful farm, California, for four years of hard labor at USDA. Now these courses were not just done by Mark. He led a team of USDA career employees from across several agencies, and including Betsy Rokola, former student of mine who designed the webinar. And the USDA employees, they were thrilled to be a part of this effort, thrilled. USDA has 110,000 employees. They come in all shapes and sizes. Back in 1999, I found myself needing a job because the NGO where I work, the Henry A. Wallace Institute for Alternative Agriculture, closed its doors. I had just had a baby, and my husband um, took a sabbatical to stay home with my daughter. And I was in a panic because we needed income. Back then, being young and naive, I referred to USDA as the evil empire, and only half-jokingly. Desperate times, desperate actions, I figured. I went to see Rich Rominger. You know him, former Secretary of Agriculture here in California, and at the time, the Deputy Secretary at USDA. Rich said he'd find me something at USDA. And between him and other friends, I landed the job of the Agricultural Marketing Service Administrator last couple of years of the Clinton administration, where I oversaw the second and final rulemaking on organic increased E. coli testing uh, requirements for ground beef sold in schools, became front page of the New York Times uh, story, a lot of controversy, um, would not seat boards and committees that failed to address diversity concerns. These were among many things that I did over 22 months as administrator. So geez, USDA wasn't the evil empire at all. I loved it there. Sure, there were some USDA staff hell-bent on making my life difficult by creating bureaucratic barriers and reaching out to industry and churning up the politics. But I found far more employees who were dedicated and so excited to have me there. Just one example, I had staff pulling all-nighters to get that organic rule done, not because I ordered them to, but because they were passionate advocates of organic and they wanted to get it right and help nurture the industry. Fast forward 16 years. Today, the recently appointed administrator of AMS is Eleanor Starmer. 
Eleanor was one of my star students at Tufts. Oh, you know her. Where I ran the Agriculture, Food, and Environment program where Danny graduated from. Proud graduate. So Eleanor was working at Food and Water Watch when, as deputy secretary, I called and invited her to join my Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food team. She's doing tremendous work at USDA. What will she accomplish while she's administrator? This, problem, this proud mama can't wait to see. So as uh, Alexandra was talking about some of our TEAB ag food work, and I'm on the steering committee working with him and several people here today, and I think this effort is critical. And I'm really excited about the, the theme of our conference. But as I look down the road, I see two daunting tasks. <laughs> we need to build the evidence base on externalized costs for sure. This is no small fee, and it will take our collective energy to do so. Last month, I submitted a grant proposal to a new pot of money that the National Science Foundation has put out, $50 million a year, each year for five years, money dedicated to the food energy water nexus. I think it's a great opportunity for researchers here in the audience. Anyhow, in reviewing the literature to build my bibliography for the proposal, I was dismayed to see how many few studies really address the range of costs of food production. Many are looking at true, to, uh, true cost accounting, but only on limited, very limited parameters. So there's much work needed here for sure, and I'm excited to be part of Alexander and Patrick and several people's efforts. But there's the other challenge that must be dealt with simultaneously, and this goes back to your question, Danny, about USDA. There are a thousand ways that so-called cheap food is built into our policy structures and economic assumptions about food and agriculture. Some of these are, are huge, looming large, like trade balance imperatives or the cost of nutrition assistance programs. Some are small. For example, the bias toward producer profitability in any number of our regulatory battles. So getting to where we need to be on true cost accounting is not just a matter of politically expressing the desire to do so, but having a roadmap and the tools to dismantle the reinforcing superstructure which denies externalities. My point is that the evidence base of externalized costs is necessary, but not sufficient for inducing change. We need people in the trenches at USDA and in the halls of Congress to make the evidence matter. Who among us is going to queue up at the revolving door to get inside of USDA and do this work? One of the constraints inside USDA is the shallowness of our bench. We need a much larger cadre of both worker bees and political appointees that will go to the department in this new administration and help design and implement the multitude of policies that a true cost accounting paradigm will require. It doesn't have to be a lifelong commitment, and you will have support from the outside, as you have all given me. I remember after becoming Deputy Secretary, George Seaman, who refers to himself as the CIEIO of Organic Valley, came to visit me, and he delivered a beautiful drawing an OV farmer had done of a Cooper hawk. He wanted me to have this beautiful drawing on my wall because one of his previous visits of USDA, he sat outside in the garden and he saw the hawk. And he wanted to remind me that I was never that far from the great outdoors. What a lovely gesture and what a meaningful message. Any day of the week, I could look at that drawing and, and have that memory. Abraham Lincoln, he established the USDA. He established it as the people's department. It is our department. It's not them and us. And by the way, it's a very diverse department focused on supporting diverse constituencies, low-income people, people of all different races and ethnicities. One of the things I'm most distressed about these days is the degree to which young people are turned off by government. At the same time, one of the things I'm most encouraged by is the degree to which young people are all excited about food and ag. I don't know if you've seen this book, The Yum Generation. It captures their excitement over food and ag. It's a fun read. We need these young people to not only repopulate our farms and our ranches, but also policy positions in Washington, D.C. If we as a crowd are negative about government, think it's hopeless, why would we expect young people to go to Washington and help change the paradigm? I was in the First Lady's office Wednesday this week. I was on the phone with CEQ at the White House on Tuesday. I'm not giving up. There's so much work to do. We are on the cusp of a new administration. We need reinforcements. My expectation, and frankly hope, is that it will be a Clinton administration. 
Interestingly, the president's spouse will be vegan. How do we make sure food and ag are high on the agenda for this new administration? What are our key asks? We have a lot of work to do over the coming months to be at the ready. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathleen. Steve, I just want to turn to you now and, and build on what Kathleen was talking about. Uh, we heard from Jonathan Foley this morning who talked about this need for, like, not a silver bullet, but silver buckshot. How do we shake things up? How do we change the political system to really get to where we need to be with true cost accounting? Thank you very much. That is what I hope to do exactly. Shaking things up is what I love doing. It's what I tried to do when I was in the British government over in, uh, over in London. Now, just before I start, I want to say, I hope you're not too sick of people with British accents so far. Um, uh, Patrick, uh, as, as you'll know, most people in the UK do a very good uh, impression of the Prince of Wales, which I am tempted to do, but don't worry, I'm not going to do that today. Um, although I am speaking to you with a British accent, I'm also speaking as a resident of the Bay Area. We've been living here four years. I feel pretty Californian now. When you came to visit, Patrick, uh, we actually uh, got into the topic of the tale of two chickens. In fact, I had a personal tale of around 10 chickens because I actually have the benefit now of being able to, when someone like Patrick comes to lunch, go and collect the eggs from the chickens that we have in our yard, cook them up, and then serve it to our guests. So I just want you to know that I'm doing my bit for the sustainable food movement. But um, I just want to get quickly to the point. Uh, there's no need, I think, for me to talk about why we need big change. You've seen presentations this morning that have done that. I want to talk very precisely about the how. Now, uh, there's a book out there which I wrote uh, for the UK and now have rewritten for the US, which is called More Human, Designing a World Where People Come First. And the argument in that book is that right across the board of the things that people care about, whether that's government or business or our daily lives, the way we run food, or the way we run schools and healthcare, the reason that people are so angry and dissatisfied with what's going on in the world is because we have designed systems that are just too big and too bureaucratic and too distant from the human scale. And I believe that there is no issue that captures that problem of our modern world better than food. There is a chapter in my book on food, and when you get to that chapter, as I hope you will, you will see that it calls for a real shake-up going to the heart of the matter. There are proposals in there which I argued for in government, some of which we have now done in the British government, a sugar tax, a nitrogen tax, a complete ban on factory farming, making producers of food put on their packaging actual photographs of the facilities and the conditions that that food is produced in. So people really see what's going on behind our industrial food system. It's all there in the chapter of my book dedicated to this subject, but what I really want to talk about is how are we going to make this happen? Because that is a big change. It is not incremental change, it is a revolutionary change. Now I think we can do it. Just think of some of the other changes that have happened in the last few years that people would have thought are inconceivable. Look at the ban on smoking that has swept the world. Even in Spain, if any of you have been to Spain <laughs> and know Spanish people, you will know that the idea of banning smoking would have been laughed out of court. Look at the fact that a British conservative government has introduced gay marriage. Look at that incredible change that's happened so quickly. So the idea that we can't make big changes happen is simply not true. I think we can go beyond the incremental approach and call for a revolution in the way we produce food and actually make it happen. But we need to understand how. That's what I want to get to. Up till now, the problem has been that the responsibility for all this has been placed on the people who are not responsible. It is too much to ask consumers to make this change happen by changing their behavior. They're not the ones who are responsible for this. They are the victims of this. We need to go to the people whose fault this is. Now, that reminds me of something that a great American president of many years ago said, Dwight Eisenhower, when he left office, he warned about the military-industrial complex. 
When we ask ourselves, what is the cause of all this? All the terrible things you've seen today, the impact on the environment, on human health, and on animal welfare, it is a culinary industrial complex. That's what we have in this country, and that's what we need to take on. So how do we do that? We need to use the same weapon that these big food companies and big agricultural companies use to get what they want. And we all know what it is. If we could just see the slide that I've prepared based on data from my company, Crowdpack. I don't know if you can see that. Is it on these monitors? The weapon that the culinary industrial complex uses to get what it wants is money, pure and simple. It makes political donations to the people who make the laws and make the regulations. It's been going on for decades. What you can see here then is the proportion of the members of the Senate Agriculture Committee and the House Agriculture Committee who receive donations from just two big companies, um, Monsanto and Syngenta. Up here, you'll see it's 90% receive donations from just two of those companies in the Senate. If you add in just a couple more companies from the long list that we have, if you look at Cargill and so on, this immediately goes to 100%. We just don't have room on the slide to list all the companies. This is what's going on. It's money that buys the outcomes that they want from the political system. That's what we have to change. I see you have someone from Mars up here later. It would be very interesting to ask that person, where does Mars make political contributions? What does Mars do with its lobbying effort? Is it arguing for the kind of sustainable food system that we want to see? Let's ask that question. That's what we need to get to. Now, the real question is what can we all do about it? And this brings me on to the second reason that I started this company, Crowdpack, not just to inform people about what's going on in the political system, but to empower them to take action. Because in fact, there are more of us than there are of them. And if we get together, and if we pool our resources, we can defeat them. Crowdpack is a crowdfunding platform for politics. It enables anyone to create a campaign and get involved in the elections that matter to get the outcomes they want, to level the playing field with the big donors and the special interests. That's what Crowdpack does. We want to put the same kind of information and the same tools in the hands of everyone that currently is only in the hands of the insiders, and in our particular case today, in the hands of those in the big food and agriculture companies that have used the system to get what they want. So the final point I just wanted to make is very simple and very practical. In the, in the time ahead of you at this conference, I want to, make, I want to ask you one question and to give you a little bit of a task. I have built the tools that we can use to defeat big food and big agriculture where it really counts, with money and through the political system. We can create the campaigns to take out the people who are the enemies of the kind of change that we want to see. Literally, to raise the money to fund opponents to those people in the races where they are running and, and for so long have been unchallenged because all the money is coming from one side of the argument. So what I want you to do is to tell me who are the public enemy number one in this area? Who is the number one enemy of good food in the United States Congress? Who is the number one enemy of good food in every state legislature in America. Let's identify those people, let's create a campaign, let's fund their opponents, and let's take them out. Because that will be the most powerful way of showing this rotten system that change is possible, and that the people can get together and defeat those insider interests. That is how we make the change happen, in a revolutionary way, and not in an incremental way. So that is what I'm asking you to do. We can defeat these people. Whether they are running in competitive districts, and that means funding an opponent um, from a different party, or whether they are in a safe district, as so many people in our system are because of the gerrymandering of the American political system, then we will fund a primary opponent. We will get them out because we are more powerful than those interests if we act together. So that is my message to you today. We can beat big food. We can defeat the culinary industrial complex, and we can make our food system more human. Thank you very much. How many minutes? Ten? Oh, okay. 
Uh, unfortunately, I was really hoping we'd have Q&A from the audience, uh, but we, we are out of time. Uh, I want to give you each 30 seconds for some closing remarks, though. Alexander, do you want to do you want to take your 30 seconds first? I would donate my 30 seconds to one person asking a question. Okay, that's a great idea. <laughs> Keep your questions short. I'm gonna the first person I see who puts up their hand. I'm gonna I'm gonna choose them. Otherwise, I have a great question. <laughs> no one really. All right, lady in blue, hurry. Libby Burnick from True Cost. How do we change our system of insane subsidies? Alexander, go. <laughs> our approach is to do a complete valuation of all positive and negative externalities of the food system. And this includes insane subsidies, this includes unhealthy practices, and this includes destruction of the environment. We would like to capture the whole system and then we can provide alternatives how to do it. Maybe we could also support him with this revolution. We will see who will be faster. Our approach or together we can do it. Competition is always good. <laughs> but also coalitions. Do you want to comment, Kathleen? Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, crop prices are way down. The political environment for um, getting rid of direct subsidies now is not good, but we'll see what it looks like in the 2018 Farm Bill. But you've got direct subsidies, you've got crop insurance subsidies, you've got conservation subsidies, you've got food and nutrition assistance program subsidies. So it's really about calibrating and figuring out what the targets are. Um, I think that the increasingly interesting um, fervor around food, the conversation that we're all having puts us in a different position with the forthcoming Farm Bill to do some novel things. All right, I want to remind you that our panelists will be available at lunchtime, so please seek them out then. Thanks to all of them for their amazing remarks, and thanks Thank to all you. of you.